My name is Jeremy Corbell. Today we're doing an official screening of my film Patient 17. We're at the National Museum of Denmark and we're going to be showing the whole film. So I'm really excited for today. I will also be doing a lecture talking a little bit about the behind the scenes of the film Patient 17. So join me and we'll do it. This field is so broad. There are so many aspects to the, to the UFO field. There's so many different areas of interest. I will cover a, a, a number of areas today because I've made a lot of films on, on the subject. A lot of times I just play my films. They speak for me. But this time I'm going to try to kind of uh, tell you the behind the scenes on some of the stuff, some of the characters that you see I've filmed. Also, today I hope to show you something I've never been able to show anybody before because it's never been done. So this will be an epic day. Uh, towards the end, I hope to show you something uh, that you did not expect. Not a real UFO or anything. Okay. So this presentation is, is uh, UFOs are clockwork orange. It's just a very simple metaphor. As a filmmaker, the idea, as you'll see throughout uh, the, the presentation that I give today, is that uh, you know, UFOs are not as they appear, that it might be something more or different or even maybe artificial. So let's see if we get there. That's me, okay. Um, I identify myself as an investigative filmmaker. I think anybody with an iPhone and a little bit of curiosity could say the exact same thing. It's not a special title. It's just somebody that you know, decides to use the visual medium of film and investigate something that they're curious about. Obviously, UFOs is a very deep topic. I'm going to show you a few clips throughout this presentation. These clips are to kind of associate you a little bit with my work. I don't assume that you've seen my films. So this is the intro for my series, which is important because you'll see the overarching theme is not UFOs, I know everything. It's extraordinary beliefs. It's the ideas, the extraordinary beliefs of credible individuals. So here's the intro. My name is Jeremy Corbell. I seek to weaponize your curiosity. And if you're ready to suspend your own prejudice, welcome to the world of extraordinary beliefs. Are we all the product of an alien video game? The extraterrestrial technology is real. It's possible. We have material that has been pulled out of a man's leg that should not exist. This sample could not have been made on Earth because the isotopic ratios. I know there are alien craft here from another planet, but I was inside one. Who are we? And where are we actually sitting within the architecture of our universe? Are we alone? Or is the answer simply stranger than we can think? We can think. Right, so that's the, the, the kind of intro for my whole series called Extraordinary Beliefs. As you could see from some of that footage, you might recognize some of the people that w was in that video. So, Six Man to Walk on the Moon, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, right? Uh, Bob Lazar, but a modern day version of Bob Lazar. It was not very long ago. He's like the Bigfoot of UFOs, nobody can capture him on camera, right? In, in 30 years, there has been three hours, maybe, maybe total, three hours of footage of Bob Lazar talking about his experience back engineering, allegedly, UFOs for the United States government. So that was incredible to get him almost 30 years later now. Uh, you noticed I, I filmed inside of a Hasidic uh, Jewish temple, a synagogue, right? Uh, I've been able to get access to some of the craziest places that I never thought possible simply because I pointed a camera at somebody. So the camera has, for me, acted like a, a passport into the unknown. And I think that really what's behind that is, is curiosity. With, with real curiosity, um, people want to tell their story. I don't remember, I'm, I barely have any sleep from, you know, I just got here to Denmark. Thanks for having me. I don't know if I said that yet, but thanks for having me again here. And Frederick for putting this on. I mean, it's a real pleasure to talk to you guys and have the opportunity to share some of the stuff I'm very passionate about. Um, I'm a very nuts and bolts person. Does that translate 
properly? Okay, I don't think my humor will, but at least that does. Um, right, okay, it says it up there. So I'm a very nuts and bolts person. When it comes to UFOs, this is how I began. It's just very simple, mechanical. That's what first started my whole interest in the subject. So I consider myself to be very straightforward, very nuts and bolts. However, a lot of my friends and my mom up in that corner, they consider me to just be fucking nuts. <laughs> this is a taboo subject for some people. For me, this is a problem. It's the UFO problem. What I mean by that is, to a degree, there is a solution. I like to believe that. that I like to believe that tomorrow, I'm going to know more about this mystery than I do today. So I call it the UFO problem because it, it's an it's a ideological problem. It's a problem of faith, of spirituality. For some people, it's a problem of um, you know, mechanics. So I, when I say it's a UFO problem, understand that it's more that I'm saying that there are solutions to be found. There are things to be learned. That's what I mean by that term. Within the UFO problem, there are many things that I've been able to study and become a part of. Uh, Skinwalker Ranch, a very famous location with high activity of UFOs. Obviously, Area 51, the CIA. I got to question a bunch of CIA um, heads about UFOs. Bob Lazar, another person whose story fascinated me. Um, cold fusion is something else I've been able to look into from following the same train of thought, the same mystery. Dr. Edgar Mitchell, sixth man to walk on the moon. And Dr. Roger Lear, who you saw was uh, the subject of, was initially the subject of my film I showed you today, Patient 17. Although Patient 17 became the real subject of that film. All together, all of these things that I've been able to film and, and get deep into, ultimately, it, it, it's all what I call the phenomenon. It's just a simple blanket term that I use to describe all of these things because I have quickly learned that it's not just about hard metal silver disks visiting from potential other star systems. That the UFO phenomenon, it encompasses so much of the human experience from faith to belief to medicine to psychology so if you're picking up what I'm putting down, I'm basically saying this is a vast mystery. That's why we need so many different perspectives. That's why we need so many different professional individuals looking at this from a standpoint of art, to journalism, to science, to faith, to mythology, to psychology. We need people in all fields to contribute and not be passive. Mark my words, there is a mystery, a true mystery here. This phenomenon is real. It's happening. It's tangible. It's partially physical. But you could deny it all day long. It is a real phenomenon. I think I'm preaching to the choir. So I'll shut up. Okay. Usually that's when people start throwing things at me. Anyway. Yeah, so I was 13 years old. Uh, somebody asked me, why did you get interested in this? Uh, the gentleman asked me over here, why did you get interested in this? Uh, really, I was 13 years old, and on the radio I heard my, who is now my mentor in journalism, George Knapp, and he was interviewing the famous Bob Lazar, right? The cosmic whistleblower. The, the guy who, if he's telling the truth, the same story he's been telling you for 30 years now, if he's telling the truth, then we need to start accepting that truth. Okay, so I heard Bob on the radio with his uh, best friend, Gene Huff, and they were talking about the propulsion system. The propulsion system that Bob Lazar allegedly worked on at a sub-base of Area 51 called S4, or Site 4. And why that weaponized my curiosity, why that threw me into this world of interest is because, and I'll try to explain it very simply, it flipped the script, it flipped my thoughts. I went from thinking that, as a, as a kid, I went from thinking locomotion, you have, to, you have to push, and you have to push against something to go forward. So I was kind of in your guys' camp. 
oh, of course there's life out there in the universe. Although when I was, when I was 13 years old and I was talking about this, I mean, people really thought I was crazy. Uh, most of you in the room know what it was like, you know, 30 years ago or 20, you know, 28 years ago talking about this. Uh, it, it was not, not accepted. Not accepted at all. Very different. Now people, of course the life is team, the universe is teeming with life. It's like as if they thought of it themselves, right? But it's just because science is catching up. But I was in your camp. There, there, I'm sure there's intelligent life, but are they coming here? I mean, I've never seen anything, so are they coming here? But the way Bob Lazar described the propulsion system, it immediately changed the way that I looked at space-time travel. Really, really simple. He talked about an energy source, and an, en and an energy source that was so powerful that the gravity waves extended beyond the mass of the energy source. And as we know, a wave can be amplified. And if you could amplify that wave, then you're projecting these are emitters of gravity. If you can do that, anything is possible. The moment you can amplify a wave, which now we know gravity is a wave definitively, which back then we didn't when Bob talked about it. But if you can amplify a wave of gravity, then wherever you project that, you can literally fall wherever you want to go in, in space-time. That's the basic concept. It's not locomotion. It's not pushing forward. It is literally falling into place. Like if you have a mattress and a bowling ball on that mattress, and you push your fist down on the mattress, and the bowling ball will fall to your fist. That same kind of idea. It's, it's completely different. It doesn't take hundreds of thousands of light years to get somewhere anymore. Your, your, your space and time is elastic. So man, that really flipped my script. That really made me think. But you know, I was 13, I didn't give a shit after I thought about it. <laughs> so I went on with my life, and my life was very different than being an investigative filmmaker. I'll show you like 20 seconds. I did something called jujitsu, which is a martial art. This is for show. I don't even recognize myself. That's like a previous life. Um, so that's a little clip uh, that basically shows a demonstration I did for kids, that kind of thing. But it was a very hard impact, high impact life. It was high science. But uh, you can only do that for so long. So when my became less painful to do what I do now. Anyway, something happened to me uh, during that time of my life when I was dedicated to jujitsu. I never thought I would do anything else. That was it. I lived, breathed, bled jujitsu. But at some point, and, and I mean this very uh, tangibly, my curiosity was weaponized. And, and people don't like hearing that because it doesn't make sense to them, right? I, what I mean by that is something very simple, which is that my curiosity became so powerful, it forced me to do something about it. Instead of being a consumer of information on this topic, I just, I had to be a contributor. And I think that that's the biggest thing that I can say, you know, in any time I talk with a group of people, we need more bright minds dealing with this subject. Anything you can do to contribute to our understanding of this in whatever way you can, please do. That's what I mean. I, I want to weaponize your curiosity. I want to make it so uncomfortable for you to do nothing about this that you end up doing something. Uh, so anyway, I uh, wondered what it would be like to be an investigative filmmaker. And luckily, I am very persistent. I think my greatest quality as far as getting things done is I can be really annoying to people that ignore me. And I was just really annoying. Finally, I found this journalist who I really respected. And I, I just, I, I said, I, you know, I need to know what it's like to be an investigative journalist. What, how do you do this? And I want, to, I want you to hear it from him. How do you get people to talk? How do you win the trust of a source? Yeah, it's a tough question. And it's easier for me now because people know me. And I've been around a long time. And I have a reputation as somebody who keeps his word. And that's whether it's uh, organized crime figures telling me something they don't know what the cops to know or whether it's some national security type operative, somebody working in a sensitive uh, 
government position for the military or an intel agency. A lot of those folks have shared information with me and I kept my word and kept my mouth shut. Uh, you know, they give you information that helps you understand the bigger picture. You may not be able to use it directly, but it helps you understand how things fit together. I would be out of business if I don't keep my word to you. If I tell you that I'm not going to use something or if I'm going to protect your identity and I violate that trust, I'm out of business. That word gets around and I could not be a reporter over a long period of time if I didn't keep my word. So that was George Knapp. Okay, I want to tell you about him, but first what he taught me. Being a journalist, you have to have integrity. Your word is your word. Your word is your bond. You have to be reliable. I mean, these, these seem like simple things, but they're really fucking important. You have to be accurate when you're telling people's life stories, when you're asking them to talk about something really sensitive. You have to be accurate. If you're not accurate, you're screwed. One mistake. You have to be, uh, you know, have attention to detail and be sociable. You can't be a jerk. You need to be sociable or people are not going to tell you these deeper experiences that they had. We're not talking about what did you buy at the grocery store yesterday. We're talking about how is your complete paradigm shifted because of your encounter with a UFO. So that's, you know, these are the things that he has instilled upon me. I've had the opportunity to mess them up and I haven't, but that's a choice every time. But the number one thing you need in this field as an investigative filmmaker, the number one thing. Yeah, yeah. You have to have a huge fucking bullshit meter. Sorry, mom. She hates it when I curse. The, the point is, is that most people are full of it. I'm sorry. It's just true. Most people are full of it. And you wonder why. Why would you waste your time? And usually it's just that people feel lonely. They need recognition, you know? So you, you, you have to do that because if I chased every story that was presented to me, if I can't move the needle forward, you might be telling the truth, but I can't help you. So, so we all have to decide how we spend our time in this field, however you're going to contribute. Um, okay, so how do I make my films? Uh, you know, I think this is something that you know, a lot of people ask me, and the simple question is, very, very slowly. So don't expect much from me, okay? I'm a one-person show. I film, direct, edit, audio engineer, produce everything on my own. It's a miracle to me that one of my films is going to be mass distributed. You know, this is something I, a labor of love. So I, I do it all by myself. But the thing is, is uh, the main thing I do is I look for people closest to me. You all have people close to you that, that, are, that have fascinating stories that you could engage in their lives. You have to start with the people and the things closest to you. Interestingly enough, one of the people closest to me, do you guys know about Star Trek? This is all about aliens. This is about the prime directive. I mean, this is like, whoa, this is something that I figured would be really cool. Well, I, I thought you would enjoy this. One of my dear friends growing up was the son of Gene Roddenberry, but he had never talked about aliens or UFOs publicly. And I thought that was crazy because he's, um, you know, an important person in this philosophy that was, that was put all around the world uh, of acceptance, you know, for example, is one of the, the key tenets. So I had him, his name is Eugene Roddenberry, and I just want to show you a little message he has, um, actually for you guys. My name is Eugene Roddenberry. Uh, I am the son of Gene Roddenberry, creator of Star Trek. I believe there's life on other planets. I hope that they are, are super evolved and highly intelligent and, uh, and have chosen, I, I would like to think, chosen not to interfere because they're letting us sort of evolve and make our own mistakes. Although I've heard other stories from people that they have involved themselves, but that's another discussion. I don't have any fears about it. Like so many people will be like, oh, I, I shouldn't say anything because that UFO thing, it's, it's shrouded in all this sort of like, all these crazy people talk about it. it for me, it's very scientific and matter, matter of fact. With all the different sightings out there, if one is true, then yeah. And, there's, and at least one of them's gotta be true to a degree. You know, with all the billions of planets, with all the billion chances for life, there's gotta be life out there. I think it's stupid to, to think there's not. 
If you could ask an alien one thing, what would it be? Oh, that's a great question. How did they get to where they are today, assuming they're a more advanced species? And, because it would give me hope that maybe we can get to that point one day too. Did your father ever see a UFO? To the best of my knowledge, no. To the best of my knowledge, I do not know. Actually, to be completely honest, I'm, I'm totally unaware if my father ever knew about any sort of UFOs or had any interaction. And you've never seen a UFO before? I've never seen a UFO. No. Would, you, would you like to if they exist? I kid me, I'd want, to, I'd want to fly in one. I wouldn't want to fly it, I'd want to be in one. But you know, what is a UFO? I mean, obviously the language unidentified flying object could mean anything, but I think what we're talking about is a craft built by another race, another species from an alien world. And that would be cool to see. A highly advanced intelligence that builds a craft that can somehow traverse space-time. Right, yeah. That's not what UFO means, but that's what we're talking right, about. Right, that's what we're talking about, right. Do you have anything that you'd want to say to the audience right now? You know, the, the only thing I would want to say to the people in this particular audience is, I, 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 I am a believer that there is some sort of life out there, and my preference is intelligent life that's evolved beyond ours. Um, and I appreciate everyone who's been out there kind of trying to find it, who's been digging deep. Um, I mostly appreciate those who have looked at it in a way that is uh, scientific and rational and, and through deduction and trying to find evidence and proof. It's an uphill battle. I mean, I have no doubt whether, whether it's just because the general public isn't willing to believe or whether because officials and whatever programs are closing doors and not letting you know. Um, I, I, but I do appreciate that there's people out there who, are, who keep asking the question and keep knocking on those doors and keep discovering things. Um, I, I am excited for you all to be vindicated, for, for us to meet that alien life form or whatever it is and for however many millions of you are out there, see, like, see, we're not crazy, there's life. And I, I, I don't know if I believe that'll happen or I just want it to happen. It's both. I believe it will happen and I want it to happen. Because I am a believer too that there is, there's, there's got to be something beyond us. Because <laughs> the universe is a big place. I really appreciate uh, his perspective. Uh, you know, he's a very analytical person, uh, but he comes from this, you know, kind of family heritage where he should have an opinion. So it's nice to finally get that opinion from him. So you guys, everybody watched this movie today. So I I'm gonna go over some of the fine points on it and we'll see how deep we go into this. This is the most significant pieces of actual UFO and extraterrestrial data we have ever seen. Who are we? Are we alone? And where are we actually sitting within the architecture of our universe? I was recently introduced to a surgeon who claims to remove implants nanotechnology microchips embedded by aliens. Dr. Roger Lear did confirm I was going to be patient number 17. He says a little spot here that shows through. Yeah, it's right there. I send half the object in for analysis and tell us whether the material is from off planet. We're talking about something that is highly advanced and fabricated by an intelligence. Is that correct? Yes. I don't have any answers. I'm still doubting Thomas on what this could possibly be. I just want all this to end. I just want it removed. This is scarier than hell. Wow. We have a total of 36 elements here. This is the most astounding array of elements in a single sample I've ever seen. It's the biggest story of the 20th and 21st centuries. It's the, the biggest story never told. I've been trying for months to get a hold of Steve. He's changed his phone number, won't answer any of my messages. 
What are your thoughts? I'm telling you, it's not from here. This sample did not come from our solar system, much less the Earth. Cool. So that was a trailer that was just cut uh, for the film, you know, for its premiere. That's what will be going out very soon to people. Hopefully they'll see the movie soon. This is Dr. Roger Lear. He's the man who started the whole concept of cutting these things out of people's bodies. Uh, he has now passed away, as we talked about earlier today. This is what it looked like when it was, the x-ray was done of the object. And uh, this is one of the telltale signs, according to Dr. Lear, is that the shape of these things. They're very similar in, in the patients that he's cut them out of, allegedly. Again, uh, patient 17 is the reason why I was interested in doing this movie after the first day. Just seeing the way that people were trying to take from him and just take his story. And really, I wanted to help him find answers because I myself wanted answers. So he's really the reason why I, I've stuck with this investigation to the point where I could put out a, a movie on it. Um, although there's a lot of work to be done and there probably will be a part two after we get the, the sample back. We will find out and prove definitively one way or the other what this is. But I do want to talk to you today about some of the details of what we found in the sample because it is extraordinary. Uh, you, these are scenes that I just thought would, would show you a little bit of humor. Um, that's literally a stud finder in his hand. That's a carpentry tool. And uh, I found it very strange that that's what they were using to find these objects. There's no possible way they were finding these objects with these. So it was a kind of strange situation. They were using a black light to look for signs of abduction. OK. Yeah, I'll continue. Um, yeah, I found that very strange. They, they took sample of the blood so that when they removed the object, they could then put it in back with the original tissue and everything of the body, which I thought was interesting as well. Um, show you a few images from the surgery itself, which you've seen now like five times today. But as you can see, I mean, it's no little deal. I mean, they're really like ripping into patient 17 skin and pulling out this object. I would not like to do it myself. The object did not look extraordinary by any means. It's the little bit of black that's in there. Looked like a piece of pencil lead or something, uh, just visually. And then they encased it in, in, in the serum of his own blood. And we took it to SEAL Laboratory, which is one of the top scanning electron microscope places in all of Los Angeles. They're a great, credible lab. We took over the laboratory and we started doing some of the initial analysis. I was sure on this day we were going to get some answers. Uh, I was positive. I was also very naive. This is the, the Gauss meter, again, the electromagnetic frequency thing. Once it was out of the body, we were really not getting much of a reading off of this object. We, if you held it up to my camera, you would because of the battery in my camera. So we put it in the machine, and all of a sudden, I realize everybody around me is seeing something different than what I'm seeing, in that anything under high-powered magnification ends up looking extraordinary. It looks absolutely incredible. It looks like the topography of the moon. It's incredible. But depending on who you are and what you want to see, you're seeing different things. So I wanted the hardcore physical scientific data, which are two things you can really look at, elemental analysis and isotopic analysis. And I want to make sure you understand what those things are. But at this point in the investigation, this article came out, The Smoking Gun. And it's talking about object number 17. This really pissed me off. So I read this article. I know for a fact the analysis had not been done yet. And there's an article saying it's the smoking gun. So I was furious because I told Dr. Lear I was going to expose him if he's trying to mislead the public. Anyway, I started reading the article a little bit more. And they were talking about other samples and incorporating results from other samples. So it was, it was not a lie. But I felt it to be misleading because we had not done the analysis. So I was even more eager to get scientific analysis done on this object so I could case close 
fun movie, done, right? That was the idea. And then, of course, Dr. Lear passed away right then. He had a heart attack. And, I mean, I talked to him the day of, I believe, um, he, when he died. And it was a shame because it was like a boat it had lost its captain, right? There was nobody really, you know, to, for me to follow to say, okay, well, how do you do it? What's the next step? Dr. Lear was a very sane, rational person, so I enjoyed talking with him about it. So anyway, I had to do the scientific analysis myself, finally got the piece, sent it to the lab, and here's what I want to talk to you about today, specifically about this, before we get into the other weird stuff. All the elements in, in red are what have any abundance in this piece. There are 36 elements, okay? The majority of those elements, any of you here are material scientists, or you can read these types of documents, the majority is iron. I mean, like the mass majority of it is iron. We're talking about parts per million of all these other little bits. So I didn't think it was like really that interesting that you know, it had all these other things in it, but apparently it is. To have the, these many different elements playing nicely together in a sample is very unusual. Like if you just took a piece of iron or a nail, you're not gonna have all these trace elements, is what I've been told. I haven't uh, done other analysis. But this was the big one. This is, we, we looked at, uh, was it zinc and copper? Uh, we looked at the, the isotopes. So the, the, the way to, to simply describe this is if you take a piece of mountain and you cut it, there's going to be five types of zinc in that mountain, five different types of isotopes to stabilize the zinc, four of which you can really test for. The terrestrial ratios, how much of that isotope of zinc is going to be the same on Earth? It's the same. If you're outside by 1%, after you calculate for a margin of error, if you're outside the terrestrial norm by 1%, that is huge, that is definitively non-terrestrial. So remember that, 1% is everything, okay, after margin of error. So we look at two different uh, elements. We looked at six different isotopes out of those two different elements. So I knew nothing about any of this, and I needed to kind of get an education in it. So I started looking at things like from Apollo 15, for example, they did amazing isotopic analysis from the moon, which has different isotopes than on Earth. So the ratio of isotopes on the moon is different than on Earth. And it's different in, in the Andromeda galaxy. So you can, start to, you can start to know where something is from, if it is, in fact, extraterrestrial by the isotopes. That's how we determine if things are extraterrestrial, is by the isotopes. Making sense so far? Okay, it took me a fucking year to understand that. Okay. So I started looking into, well, we do study extraterrestrial isotopes here on Earth. We do it all the time. There are specialists in this. Lucky for me. Okay, so I start contacting all these people that wrote these scientific papers, and I talk to them about stabilization of isotopes, you know, that are extraterrestrial, and I start learning and, and, and learning and learning, and we come to something very simple, and this is not disputed. This is simple. These are the abundances of isotopes. For example, zinc 64, right, is 48.63. That is accepted. That is the terrestrial norm. There, there's one other number people go by, but that's, th this is the accepted one right here. Isotopic abundance is found in sample 17. Notice the zinc 64. So we're at 51.1%, and notice that that is a standard, relative standard deviation of 1.25%. So that's huge. So we're basically saying you need to cut off 1.25 above or below because you know, our machines don't exactly do better than that. So terrestrial abundance, 48.63. Sample number 17, 51.1. Remember what I said, 1% is everything? So at the highest, if the standard deviation right, of, of 1.25, at the highest, is 52.35, at the lowest it's 49.85. If it's correct, 
without the standard deviation above or below, the sample is 2.47 outside the terrestrial norm. It could be as high as 3.72 or it could be as low as 1.22. So we're looking at 2.47 outside the terrestrial norm. How the hell is this in a guy's leg? I mean, this is to me now really interesting. I did not expect this. Patient 17 did not expect this. In fact, it annoyed us because all of a sudden we don't know what to think. So, so this is now one test. I went to my mentor, George Knapp, and I was like, okay, look, you've been down this road a bunch of times. This evidence seems too good to be true. What do I do? And he's like, dig deeper. Don't publish anything. Dig deeper. Find out more. Okay, well, how do I do that? I found the one specialist on this earth who dealt with zinc extraterrestrial isotopes. I found this research paper from like 12 years ago, and this doctor in middle America who's like now a normal doctor, I call him up. And I started asking him all these questions about extraterrestrial zinc isotopes. And this guy thought I was just fucking mad. You know, he's like, we, but he really quickly, really quickly started to figure out where I was going with this. And, and I was like, look, man, you wrote like one of the definitive papers on extraterrestrial zinc. Uh, this is a very specific question, but I need to know, you know, is there anything to these results? Because these were from an accredited lab, one of the best labs in the world. Northern Analytic, you can look, look up this lab. And he looks at the results and he tells me they're impossible. That there's contamination, okay, first time I heard that, let me, let, me, let me get into that. Or the lab is pulling one over on me. <laughs> anyway, I said, okay, tell me about contamination. That is very interesting. Okay, nickel 64 can sometimes be seen as zinc 64. In order for that to happen, you have to have not washed. They call it washing the zinc. You have to triple wash it. I said, great, we found an answer. No problem, I'm calling the lab. So I call the lab. They have no idea what the results are. They like basically print them out and send them to you. I get the guy to pull up the file, pulls up the file, and I say, is there any chance that you have contaminated my sample? And of course, he's on the defensive because he, no. I, it says right here, we triple washed the, the zinc. This is our livelihood. Governments depend upon our results. What, why would we cut corners for, and give you bad results? Sometimes it's a matter of life and death. These are for materials. Sometimes they do analysis for materials for, for um, planes. I said, okay, good point. Will you look at the results for me? So he looks at the results and, and he starts kind of getting silent, you know, on the phone, like, st like stuttering, like, uh, um, uh, oh, oh, yeah. So I start to notice that he too sees these results are interesting. And I go, okay, so what do I do, man? What, so you're telling me your lab gave me the good results. You see my issue here. And he goes, look, this is, this is your problem. We just do analysis. I can't tell you what it is that you have. Okay, fair enough. Anyway, the point is, with one test, I can't prove that it was uh, not contaminated. I need to do more tests. But it was interesting to see everybody's reaction. It was very telling about the psychology of humanity, you know, when something is outside of your scope of belief. I then went to um, UCLA, the head uh, meteorite specialist, because Dr. Lear and people were throwing around these terms like meteoric iron, and I didn't even know what that was. In fact, it's not meteoric iron. Definitively, object 17 is not a meteor. It is not meteoric. It is definitively not a meteorite. I asked one of the world's specialists, top specialists, not a meteorite. They can tell by how much, I think, nickel is with, mixed with the iron. So we have something that's not a meteorite, has 36 elements, has definitively non-terrestrial zinc isotopes as long as there's not some gross huge error. So this is a very anomalous, strange material, and it happened to be pulled out of a man's leg who's had abductive experiences his whole life. So good subject for a movie. Patient 17, as you can see in his face through like the majority of the movie, he is not happy about it as a religious man, and he's also very confused by all these people telling him he's got this crazy thing in his leg. 
Um, I have a little, tiny little clip from the movie just so you can see the psychology that he has to deal with. Do you still have um, patient number 17 sample? Yes. I think most people are, are like the fish. Most, most of the masses of humanity like the fish and they don't really know or care what's outside their immediate uh, sphere of influence. And uh, we, we need to um, be better than that as a, as a race. What are we looking to learn about patient number 17? The isotopic analysis will tell us if the material is from off the planet, so that's very important. Well, if this thing is emitting frequency, there's got to be a way to capture that data somehow. Uh, the ultimate goal is to hack the alien internet. We have reason to believe there's a complex uh, web of communication between um, aliens and some supercomputer someplace, and abductees are also plugged into this system. It's, it's the biggest story of the 20th and 21st centuries. It's the, the biggest story never told. I mean, that's where the, the scope of my you know, ability to even conceive of what he's saying has just been blown out of the water. Uh, he believes that. I, I, I don't know what to say about that. Uh, he is saying, because I, I asked that question that one of you asked me earlier, well, if it's emitting frequency, can't you study that frequency? Of course, that's what I want to know, right? We all want to know that. And he basically says, you know, look, we're all part of this alien internet, all of us abductees, and, uh, you know, essentially, but that is the goal, hack the alien internet. And I was like, okay. Well, that puts patient 17 at a crossroads. You know, he's just a man, a, a typical individual, a very, as he says, a, a normal person with an extraordinary experience. It puts him in a position where we're trying to find out for him, you know, once and for all what this is. That's about this film, patient 17. Uh, you guys got to see a, a premiere of it today, first time ever. The Orchard is the company that picked me up to distribute my film. You know, there's a lot of great artists out there and they never get their movies seen, they never get their books published, and they're great, right? So I feel very fortunate. For me, this is a success story. Whatever it is that you do, if you're just really annoying and you don't stop, eventually, you know, it will, it will work for you. I, I believe that because it happened to me. They called me and asked me, why don't you let anybody put your movie out? Because everybody wanted to change it. They wanted to change it somehow. And it just, it wasn't worth it to me. So with The Orchard, I don't have to change it. So you will see on October 10th, it'll be on iTunes. So if you have iTunes, you know, please spread the word. It really does help me if more and more people see this. It's a big opportunity. It will be on iTunes on October 10th. You know, let people know. Uh, it will then be reaching into a whole bunch of other ways you can watch it. But the iTunes is the big one. That's the launch. Okay, um, that's it. So what, what is the big picture? I have one last thing from George Knapp where he's talking about the big picture of UFOs. What is the big picture? Just want you to hear a kind of summary of what I've just been talking about and George is way more articulate than me. And he always says the same thing in this video. It's strange. What the fuck is going on? The best I can put together is that there is another intelligence, probably a lot of other intelligences that interact with us in a variety of ways. They can enter our reality and mess with us and leave, and there's not much we can do about it. Uh, it seems that they have some sort of inherent interest in us, whether we, it is the cosmic drive-in movie theater that they just come and like to watch us because we're so damned entertaining, or it's harvesting of souls, or there's genetic material that they need, something they need from us. It's clear that it is a symbiotic relationship, that there is something they need from us, that it's not just a passing interest. They're not just driving by and looking out the window. They've been here a long time. They've been interacting with us throughout human history. What their ultimate aim is, I don't know. Uh, I, I really don't. I, I don't know that anybody knows. I also suspect that this mystery is much bigger than just extraterrestrials visiting from other planets. Jacques Vallée said it to me one time. He said, man, I'm going to be really disappointed if the end uh, of this mystery, at the end of this, that I, it turns out these are just visitors from other planets popping in now and then. Uh, he suspects, as I have come to suspect, that it is much bigger and grander, and much harder to get your head around. I mean, you know, the stuff about Area 51 is a fantastic story. It is difficult to absorb 
and difficult to get your head around, but there is a bigger and more uh, complicated mystery uh, that uh, is at work. Skinwalker Ranch stuff that we've pursued has, has taught me that, is that whatever this intelligence is, it really does mess with us. And sometimes it likes to scare us and keep us off balance. And it leads us down false paths. I don't know if it's just mind games or it's entertainment, or it is some sort of a steep learning curve. That's what I hope it is. I, I, and, I, and I think it might be that we are being led down a really long, steep learning curve, being educated along the way. And we're maybe now we're in junior high and someday we'll get to high school. And, and if everything goes well and we don't blow ourselves up, maybe we'll get to college someday and finally get a degree that teaches us about cosmic awareness. We're not close to it yet, and I, I'm not sure any human really understands it and has all the answers. Right. So, you know, that brings me back to the beginning, which is the, you know, the basic concept, UFOs are clockwork orange. It, it, it basically, after all these films that I've been making and now are going to start coming out because I have um, distribution now with one film, leads to the next to the next. So now I can get films out to you directly and, uh, and successfully. What I have found in all of this research, I'm gonna put my belief down like they were asking you guys, you know, what is your belief you know, after you made this book? You know? And I could be totally wrong, but what it seems like to me now is that UFOs are not at all what they appear to be. And I'm, I don't have a firsthand experience like some of you might. I'm talking to a UFO group. UFOs, and the experiences that people have relayed to me seem to be some sort of display. It seems to be an educational process, meaning that we can tell by the method and by the, 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 the pattern that these things tend to be in waves and, and show themselves and, and what's communicated. If you start to put that all together over time, right? you start to see that there is an education going on. There's something being conveyed depending on culture and time. What is shown is always just advanced from where we are now. The most depressing moment in my whole UFO studies, I had Jacques Vallée up to my ranch, you know, the old school godfather of real hardcore UFO information and study has had access to, to, to government databases. And I was like sitting there and the sun's going down. And I'm like, this is it, Jeremy, ask him, ask him. And I'm like, hey, Jacques, so what is this all about? The UFOs, what, what's actually going on, you know? And he just like takes this long pause and he's like, you're asking all the right questions. You're asking the big questions. It took me 50 years to ask those questions. You're asking the right questions, but I don't know the answers. It's a big a mystery to me today as, as it was back then, but, but, but at least you know the right questions to ask. And I was like, Jock, that is depressing as hell. <laughs> Just, you know, you're supposed to tell me what's going on the, the easy way. But anyway, point being that uh, I, I think it's much bigger than, than saucers. I think it's much bigger than the narrative that's being told. I think it's much bigger than the, in, the, the individual experience. Because if you talk to somebody who had a close encounter, it's never just, I saw a disc. It's never just a little, I saw a disc. There's always more to it. But people are afraid to tell you because they tell you they're going to feel discredited. It's okay to say you saw a disc or a light. But to tell you anything more, it's too scary. It's too strange. It's too weird. So anyway, that's the concept. UFOs are clockwork orange that, you know, like uh, it, 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 it represents something, but it is not what it represents. That's my website. You can see everything there. I hope you go there and enjoy it. Again, thank you so much. I'm just, it's just an opinion I have, but look for my movies coming forward. Uh, there will be a lot coming out. And thank you so much for your time and attention today. Thank you.